So uh, I guess we can get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming and spending some time with me today and talking podcasts. I see a lot of familiar faces, so thanks. Um, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Amy. I work at the Yale School of Management. I'm director of digital. Um, I wear a lot of hats um, within the communications department. I often, uh, I sort of describe that as sort of part product, part project, social, and now sort of like a work side hustle being a podcast producer. So um, I'm really lucky in that we have a broad team with lots of talent. And so um, we're able to kind of job craft as we go. And so podcasting is just something that sort of came to me recently and I, I absolutely love it. Um, so, so why am I the director of digital talking to you about podcasts? So and actually, I'm gonna talk about my commute a little bit. I commute about two hours a day. Um, and I've been working here for almost seven years, so I've done the math, and that's 2,688 hours of commuting, um, which is a lot of podcasts. I can't tell you exactly how many hours of podcasting that is, but I love podcasts. I listen to them often, um, and a lot of us within my, you know, within um, SOM have have just thought oh, we should really launch a podcast. So, you know, it's taken a couple of years to go from let's launch a podcast <laughs> to actually doing it. So I thought. I should talk about it. I should share our, share our journey a little bit. And I wanna stress, I'm not an expert. So feel free to leave the room. I won't be offended, but I'm definitely not a podcast expert. Um, I'm just somebody like you who loves podcasts, who, who wants to promote and celebrate the great work we do at my school and has found that this is a great platform to do that. So I thought I would share with you our journey um, uh, for, for that. So, but first, um, oops, first I wanted to, here are a few of the podcasts I love and listen to. Um, it changes all the time, but um, I don't know. It's sort of like looking in my purse, or you know, this is, this is if you open my podcast app, this is what you would see. And of course, career conversations um, is what I'm going to is what I'm here to talk about today. So I probably do not need to make a case for podcasts because if you're here, chances are you're a fan of the medium or want to get to know it a little bit better. Um, podcasting is not new. It's been around for quite a while, but it is professionalizing right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, listening platforms and um, innovations happening within podcasting that are pretty exciting. Um, there was a recent, or sort of recent, Pew uh, survey that shows that podcast, the podcast audience is growing. 26% um, of Americans have listened to a podcast at least once a month, um, and they tend to be more college educated. And that's good for us at Yale. For, us, for those of us who create content at Yale, this seems to be a great platform. There are college-educated folks who are probably interested in what we're all doing. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in where podcasting is going, I actually just listened to a really fantastic episode um, on the A16Z uh, podcast about where they think is going, some of the innovations that are happening. So I encourage you to check that, that episode out. I've linked to it in my presentation, which I can, of course, share. So I'm going to introduce you to our, our podcast. It's called Career Conversations. Um, and if, you, if I find you looking at your phone, I hope you're subscribing to our podcast right now. So um, wherever you get your podcast, just search for Yale Career Conversations, and you should find it pretty easily. Um, uh, subscribe, rate us. If I don't say that, I would be remiss. <laughs> um, so what is Career Conversations? It's a podcast series where SOM students sit down with alumni for a series of candid conversations about career paths, industries, opportunities for MBAs, uh, and discussions on various career topics. Um, they, they really range from work-life balance uh, to very specific opportunities for MBAs within a field, uh, challenges, um, and we also usually touch upon their experience at SOM uh, and even get some faculty shout outs and course shout outs as well. And of course, because um, our mission uh, is educating leaders for business and society, it's also a great platform to uh, reflect that. And so often a lot of our questions, whether they're in direct or indirect, um, touch upon how they are leaders within that confluence of business and society. So we're just about to conclude our first season of Career Conversations. Um, we've had a total of seven guests, or six here, because we're just launching one next week. Um, but you'll see we're, we've sort of attempted to uh, connect current students with alumni across sectors, um, as well as demographic backgrounds. So kind of stepping back, I thought I would 
share with you a little bit of, about how we approached career conversations. Um, it didn't happen overnight, obviously. In fact, it took quite a while. But once we decided we wanted to do a podcast, it happened pretty quickly. Um, and I think there's a spectrum of ways to execute upon um, a launch of a podcast. I think we landed right in the middle. We did a lot of strategy. We, we, you know, several of us in the communication department sat in a room. We brainstormed, then we narrowed it down. We found a, a co-producer, um, and we worked through it. But I would say, uh, you know, the more time you can spend uh, at the strategy part of your podcast launch. Um, the better you'll be. That means you'll spend less time on the production side, which is probably also going to mean that you're going to spend a lot less money. So as much time as you can spend pondering strategy um, and consulting with your colleagues across Yale, there's a lot of great folks that, uh, um, that can actually help you out in this process, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so, so what did we think? So I'll share a little bit about how Yale, how Yale SOM thought about this to, to hopefully help you on your own podcasting journey. So we wanted it to be community building exercise, both in how we put the podcast together, but also how it lived out in the world. Meaning, um, as we produce the podcast, we wanted to be connecting students and alums and faculty members using various parts of the university. Um, and so we really thought it would be a community building exercise. We wanted it to sustain and deepen the bonds among our students and, and alums. And our fans of the school, I'll say fans, because they're maybe not necessarily within our community, but people that love SOM. Um, and then we also wanted it to support our mission for business and society. That's always the lens from which we create content and share content. And, and of course, finally, um, if we're doing all that really well, we're probably um, attracting the right folks to the school, right? So prospective students, getting the right people to our programs. So, sorry, let me just... Uh, So I talked a little bit about, that was a little bit about audience, right? We have this kind of internal, a lot of internal, and it kind of builds out to the bullseye of kind of our fans and prospective students. And then we wanted to also, we wanted to also understand what the competitive landscape looked like. Um, there's a lot of business schools that are doing similar things, producing similar uh, audio formats. Um, I'd say one of the most successful is MIT's Data Made to Matter. So, um, if you're looking to launch a podcast, I feel like you should look very closely to what you're thinking about, but also look more broadly. Um, I think logistically, we're probably not going to be competing with huge, um, you know, five producer um, podcasts, but pr probably more like the HBS, uh, Michigan Ross, or MIT models. And then, of course, what's your, um, what's your USP? What's your hypothesis for, for launching this and kind of blending that all together? Um, and, and so I think that's kind of the final step in the strategy. After you've done these sort of goal uh, exercises as well as um, uh, checking out your audience uh, and competitive analysis, kind of distilling that into um, your hypothesis. And so for career conversations, that's when we came up with, um, you know, we really wanted this to be something that would reflect our entire community. And so we put students together with alums um, currently at the school talking about different, uh, with it, their experiences within each sector. So pre-production, so the first step in a podcast kind of launch or uh, is, is your strategy, right? That's kind of sitting in a room, whether it's an hour, you can take an hour, you can bring some colleagues in, spend a few hours, a few months. Um, or, or much longer. And then once you're done with that strategy process, what does pre-production look like? So I have to say that I was not prepared for the amount of time that this would take. So um, in fact, um, so prepare yourself, right? It's going to take you much longer than you think. Um, so think these are just a few of the things you want to think about in what I call pre-production. Again, did I mention I'm not an expert? So. Um, <laughs> So I learned a lot in this process, but um, you know you want to think about your production schedule and, and really kind of being as um, planning that out as much as possible. So um, this is a, kind of a glimpse at what the production schedule looked like for our season one, uh, and you'll see there's you know various fields for. I mean this is pretty specific, but I think it's good to be specific, right? Um, so you have you know when we're releasing something, who the folks are that are that are being interviewed. Um, and in our case, you know, we had to book a studio, we had to schedule Zoom calls, we had to, sometimes we had a remote producer, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this sort of represents kind of the, the bird's eye view 
Um, and then there's a lot of in-person prep. So, and you're developing scripts and briefing docs. So let me talk a little bit about that. So our podcast, we paired a student with an alum. So the student's usually on campus. The alum can be anywhere from, we've recorded interviews with folks in San Francisco and London and New York City. Um, and so uh, that takes a little bit of prep. Could, could, you know, finding a, a shared time to, to find uh, a time to record would take a little time. Um, but we like to do as much in-person prep as possible. And I, again, this is sort of the spend more time at the outset so that when you're in production, you're, you're saving yourself some time. So in-person prep is really important for all these interviews. Um, developing scripts and briefing docs. So this is also uh, something I didn't really anticipate, but which had really helped um, uh, the process. And I feel like by mid-season, I was really good at it. I was really great at creating a briefing doc. Oh, I guess you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Here we go. Um, so creating briefing documents so that both parties, wherever they were in the process, um, would understand what was going on. You'd be shocked to know how many folks uh, on the day of the podcast recording thought, is this video or is this just, you know, so it, it was still, you can never be too specific and too, to what you think is obvious. Um, so I created a briefing doc and I would encourage you in, in, in wherever you are in your podcast prep to create briefing docs, be as specific as possible and also, um, you know, scripts. Um, I think it's sort of obvious, dang the obvious, but I think scripts are really important, reviewing those scripts as much as possible with your interviewer. Um, securing audio tape sync studio time. I think we'll talk a little bit about kind of your, your quality uh, requirements, but I think that's also really important. And then uh, also Outlook reminders. I think we're all fans or not fans of Outlook, but we all use it. And uh, uh, I, I ended up using Outlook quite a bit to sort of be that locus for all that information to organize for everybody that was involved. And that was really helpful. So here's one of our students, Max Warren, um, and he was interviewing somebody who was obviously not there. And so most of our episodes you know, featured a student in our studio at SOM. We were lucky to have a studio space um, and uh, an alum somewhere else. So we thought most episodes would look like this, happy students, seamless, press a button, good to go. But that was not really always the case. Sometimes I actually had to, uh, you know, the studio wasn't available, the tape sync person canceled, and I had to drag somebody in my office, run to the Apple store to grab a microphone, quickly set up a Zencaster feed, and just record at my desk. So, um, you know, it, you never know what's going to happen with these things. So, so for production, I would say, you know, consider, um, ask yourself a few questions. Uh, what's your audio style? Uh, what's your tolerance for, for uh, great audio quality or so-so audio quality, you know, which probably depends on your budget. Um, and then have you consulted an expert? I think there's some folks here that work at the Yale Broadcasting Center, um, guys over there. And uh, of course we have one at SOM and uh, I hear CTL also has one. Um, those are all great resources. I would encourage you to seek out any resource that you can as a consultant, but I think also at the end of the day, um, consider that spectrum of quality and maybe DIY is the way to go, right? Um, so when it comes to post-production, your post-production checklist, um, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, are you gonna be editing and mixing this yourself or are you gonna hire somebody? Hire somebody. Um, <laughs> What's an MP3 file versus, and what's ID3 tagging? You should probably figure out what those things are. Just go, I mean, everything is available by Google, but again, get an editor. Um, show notes. I think this is another important part of the process when it comes to um, how you're promoting and how you're offering and, and kind of augmenting that content that you're sharing. Transcripts are really important. You know, accessibility at Yale is really important. It's something we take into consideration all the time. So, absolutely, positively transcribe your episodes. Um, when it comes to uh, reviewing and approving episodes, um, obviously we want things to be as seamless as possible and pretty quick, but I always like to give a courtesy review to the folks that I've uh, interviewed or were part of the process. Um, and then audiograms and promotion, we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. Um, so this is, uh, let's see if I can play this. Having meaning in my work is, is really vitally important. It's the main motivation for Fortunately, in healthcare, it's been relatively easy for me to find meaning in the work and you know, being able to sit with patients and their families and 
really see the impact that we have on their lives um, is a way to provide real meaning. But I think. So I just shared this one um, example uh, of promotion that we found to be successful, which is an audiogram. Um, there's free apps to do these sorts of things. So um, Headliner app um, is, is one of the ones that we've used. Um, so that's, that's something that we've utilized. So publishing and promoting, um, obviously there's so many ways and so many directions you can go with this. Uh, we tend to write a news story and we've templatized it so I'm not, I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we launch an episode. Um, we've decided to launch our, a, a new episode every two weeks so rather than just dump them all at once. Um, for us we thought it would be great to kind of slowly acquire followers and subscribers so that we can increase our uh, listenership and, and create more opportunities to promote along the way. Um, however, if you already have a great following, maybe just dumping a whole season at once is the way to go and then promoting it thereafter. Um, so we create news articles for each one. I embed a SoundCloud um, listening um, tool within that and we often will link out to some other uh, resources and show notes. Um, you'll see we post, we often post on Instagram and Twitter and then in the case of Dr. Apcon, who was one of our, um, one of our interviewees, uh, he works at the Tufts Medical Center, so uh, they were kind enough to promote that. And so sort of coordinating with your subjects, obviously, is, is sort of a, a, great, um, a great thing to always do. So lessons learned, um, you know, set aside twice the time you think you need to do anything, the whole thing. Strategy, twice the time. Production, pre-production, launching it, it's going to take three times the time. Um, 3x your budget if you can. Um, Create a trailer. Uh, what I learned sort of halfway through the process of launching was that um, getting your feed set up with uh, Apple, for example, takes quite a while. It could take anywhere from three days to three weeks. It's sort of a black box. So the trailer sort of is your, your, test, um, your test episode, if you will. So if you're going to launch anything through the Apple Store, um, I recommend you do, a you do a launch with a trailer first. And it could be a 30 second or a 10 second little bit of audio um, promoting your, your uh, podcast. But then usually thereafter, it's a pretty quick a couple hours at, at, at most. And then always have a plan B um, or a plan C and a plan D. Um, you know, I can't. As my colleagues Emily and Jonathan know who are here, um, who have heard me kind of go, go into your offices and say, can you believe Dr. Apcon's ca you know, canceled for the third time? Can you believe? So, um, you know, there's so many variables and the, 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 if you can simplify your production, the better off you'll be. So I think going into it, I thought, we don't need a host. This is great. I can pair a student with an alum. This is perfect. However, what I didn't anticipate was not having a host, and I know you're a host, right? It's, it's, hosts are great, they're important. I sort of wish I had thought of that, you know, maybe we did need a host, because so not having a host, here's what happens. I have to prep in person every student. When you're in the studio with them, you need to interrupt them, remind them how to say something, how to do something. Um, some of our students don't have, uh, you know, English maybe isn't their first language. And, um, and so you have to do many, many, many takes, which is fine. And I think that's important for us. We want that breadth of, you know, international students are important to us. Um, it just takes a little bit more prep, right, when you don't have a host. So, um, so lesson learned. Um, also, when you're scheduling interviews with faculty members who are very busy, with alums who are eminent in their field, um, these are busy folks. They certainly want to help out and engage with you. However, they're probably going to cancel on you at the last moment, sometimes with very little notice. And so what does that mean? It doesn't seem like a big deal. You have a free now, you have a, a free hour in your schedule. However, um, when you're a producer, that means telling the studio, rebooking the studio, telling the tape sync person, this happened to be with a, a person in London. I had to cancel the tape sync person in London. I had to cancel our on-site. Um, I also had to tell our student. And so there's this whole series of dominoes that falls and you have to do it. In the case of Dr. Afcon, three times. He happens to be an amazing, very nice person. So um, that helped, however, um, it, made it, it makes it extremely stressful. Um, I will also kind of, you know, I mentioned budget, triple your budget. Now, you can bootstrap this, and I encourage you to bootstrap it, right? I, you know, not everything has to be kind of a very high-end production. So, you know, 
get Zencaster, um, get a microphone from the Apple Store. If you walked out of here today, you could probably launch um, your first episode in three hours if you if you just sort of kind of again spend a little bit of time thinking about it. But um, you there's enough tools and platforms out there to do that. And I would actually encourage you to do that first as an exercise. I think that's really important. Um, I think so many of us think we want to launch a podcast and don't really kind of think through the amount of time um, that it will take uh, out, of your, out of your kind of workflow. And it will take a great deal of time. That's a great question. And actually, I had, I wasn't able to add my um, slide. I can probably pull it up in a quick sec. So I will actually share this with you. So I created a, a pseudo budget I wanted to share with you all. So think about your launch costs, think about your annual costs, and think about your um, recurring costs. So I would say it netted out, it can net out to a, a, about a $1,500 an episode. And the reason being is if you hire uh, maybe somebody to get you started, and if you have a budget, initial budget, I think it's really important to spend a little bit on hiring an external producer, which we did, to help get us kick-started. It gave us confidence. So I think that is really helpful. Um, you're going to want to think about music rights or composing some music or you know something um, like that. You're going to want to think about, um, sorry, my slides aren't advancing as easily as I thought they would. There we go. Um, so you're going to want to think about design. You know, I didn't come up with that design. You know, that was from a, a very kind of another really fantastic graphic designer who created that look and feel for us. But we wanted this to be a flagship, so we wanted to invest into it, right? Um, so you're going to think about music. You're going to think about uh, design. You're going to think about hosting platforms. Um, you're going to think about maybe you want to do some paid marketing, paid social marketing. Um, I mean, time is a, an important resource. If you were to monetize that, that would be a great deal of time as well. Um, so there's kind of a launch budget. There's a per episode budget. And then there's some annual fees. So if you decide to go with, say, um, Libsyn or Blueberry, I know um, Yale Broadcasting Center uses Blueberry. We've been using Libsyn. Um, these are platforms that if you want to um, disseminate your episodes to many platforms, makes it very easy. However, there are recurring costs anywhere from Twenty to thirty dollars a month to enterprise level can be about thirty-five hundred dollars. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that perhaps Yale at some point might have sort of an enterprise offering that we could all tap into. Um, and I'm hoping that you know, being here today and talking with all of you from my non-expert point of view, um, and with all of you, maybe we can kind of think about who here is doing what we're doing who is planning to do what we're doing, and maybe there are some cost savings in pulling together and appealing to Yale to do something kind of in a shared way um, and coordinating with Yale Broadcast and CTL and, and all the other units across the school. So these are just a couple of platforms that have made my life really easy. This is not an exhaustive list. This is, you know, this is pretty easily Googleable, but um, I wanted to give you a really short kind of crib sheet for, again, if you wanted to leave here today, just spend the rest of your af the afternoon in your office and just crank it out, you could do it with these things, right? Um, Podcaster.apple.com has pretty much any resource and every resource you could imagine to, to know how to launch um, a podcast for Apple. It will give you the aspect ratio for the images that you need for the square um, of your podcast. Uh, image. It will give you for the banner ad as well. Um, Libsyn is a great podcasting hosting platform that I mentioned. Um, Headliner app uh, will handle audiograms for you. Um, Audacity uh, will edit if you decide you want to edit yourself. Um, I'm not that brave. Uh, Zencaster is great if you just want to go in your office and capture some audio with a microphone. Um, and we use Rev quite a bit for transcripts. They're super quick. Um, and you know, within an hour or two, you can have, from delivering your file to them, uh, you'll have uh, a transcribed uh, file on your desk. So. There are, I think we looked into it for Chinese at some point. There are. A little more expensive, but you can do it. Yeah. So, so again, that was my pretty quick and not so dirty um, overview of podcasting and sort of what we've gone through. I will share my, uh, I, I have a budget that I put together. I meant to add to a slide, but I didn't do that. Um, not quite our budget, but you can approximate something. Um, but yeah, I, um, again, I hope that anybody, so who here is, 
launching a podcast or has launched a podcast? I, um, just so you folks know who I am, I'm Marilyn Wilkes. I'm the director of communications at the McMillan Center. I do a show for the past 10 years now called the McMillan Report where I interview faculty. When I originally started, we used to strip out the audio and use iTunes to deliver the podcast. But that kind of fell by the wayside. But now, podcasts are so hugely popular. I'm looking at going in that direction again. And uh, when you said 1,500 per episode, I'm thinking, I, I'll just offer some information that I'm here because I am in the throes of revamping this whole non report podcast thing again. Media services, I was just, does it for free at the moment. So you can, you can go to media services, broadcast media services, user, you know, they have a, a wonderful guy named Ryan there who will do, um, you know, all the editing and everything for free. Now, with that said, it's changing and yeah. because I'm in the throes of trying to do this. And, and also to, Amy, to Amy's point about Yale should really be looking at this from a, a higher perspective because they are going to start charging. And I was given a cost of $200 yes. to produce one episode. I mean, that's, I don't know what your budgets are like, but that's pretty much nothing. So um, if you are interested, and frankly, I shouldn't even say that because I don't want people com competing for my yeah. time. <laughs> with this. But now the cat is out of the bag. Yeah, no. So yeah, Ryan McAvoy is his yes. name. Ryan is super. Um, he does a lot of this across Yale, um, but I think his frustration, and he shares a frustration, sorry if I'm, sorry Ryan, um, I hope I'm not, <laughs> and Guy, I'm not, um, we share a frustration, which is, um, there's a lot of excitement around creating new things, but um, mm -hmm. institutional memory being as it is, sometimes aligns with our one year, two year program, sometimes those initiatives fall to the wayside. And so there's a lot of, focused energy leading up and then things get left. Um, and so I think we all want to kind of focus on the, the highest return on our investment and those kind of long lead, um, you know, flagship podcasts. So um, I would say if you're gonna go to Ryan, he's a great consultant. If you're gonna go to um, some, some of the folks like Froilan Cruz on, uh, at SOM, I don't know the person at CTL, um, sit down with them, chat with them, they'll tell you everything. They're so open and collaborative, they're great. Um, but I would love to stress more the DIY aspect of some of the tools that are out there because although they're great and right now they will do it, they will be charging very soon. Um, and if you're going to spend, yeah, yeah, oh, Julian. Me no, okay. um, a subject of ROI and just time investment plus budget investment. Mm -hmm. um, where does podcasting fit into your overall media strategy? Where do you see that in terms of, you know, adding value or not? Because it sounds like it is pretty intense labor-wise, but also fiscally. So. Sure, and um, I will say I should. We should think more about that, right, Jonathan and Emily. I think it's something that we decided this would be really like a good test. Um, we think it is a flagship. We think it speaks really well to. Um, it tells a wonderful story that are about our alums right now and about <laughs> our students and the fact that there is this wonderful kind of collaboration between them and, and the sectors they're going into. So, I think the hypothesis is it will be a great. Um, flagship for that, uh, a great part of our media but I um, offerings, but I don't know that we can say necessarily. I think we're still seeing how it fits in with the overall. Um, I, I think we'll continue to invest in it in the near term in, in, in terms of the percentage of sort of our offerings. It's really minimal. I mean, it's a pretty minimal part of it. Um, however, it takes a lot of time. So budget-wise, minimal. In terms of time for our, our folks and resources, um, probably a little bit more than I had expected and anticipated. Lori? So I'm wondering, from what you just said, it seems like there will be a season two. Are you planning to maybe revamp it to have a host to make it easier on yourself? Or are you happy with the format that it currently is? So that's hard. Yes, that's a great question. And I'm thinking about that right now. Um, I think the challenge that Jonathan, Emily, and I were talking about is. Um, if there was a host, who would it be? Um, if it were a student host, we lose students every two years or every year. Um, so there are some fantastic students. And in fact, um, it, I think it goes without saying that there's a lot of folks that go into the making of not just our season, but each episode. I'm just one of many people, including students. There's one student who really stepped up and helped me um, think through and reach out to other students. Um, so to answer your question, I think I might keep it without a host. 
Um, but I think there are ways that we can um, simplify the production process a bit. Um, and I'm, I'd also like to find ways to get more of our faculty involved, um, the, some of the practitioners involved in sharing their career advice, again, because that's kind of the theme of it. It's a lot of work, but I, for us, I think it's probably a good investment. I will complain a little <laughs> bit here and there, but at the end of the day, I think that's why we're all here, and I think that's what we're trying to do is to you know, educate, for us, educating leaders for business and society. Um, and so if that means doing a lot more prep on the front end, um, I think that's just gonna, if that's going to be how it will be for us, but. Okay. Can you share a little bit about your analytics and who are your followers, um, how, what is your, uh, so that's a great question. Um, I think we've had about 2,000 downloads right now, which is not very big, right? It's not big. Um, so I would, I would like to see that improve, but I think it's important to be honest about these numbers. Um, I really want to increase our subscribers. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we lose students right now, and over the summer it's pretty quiet, so it's hard for us. I, we've noticed. Uh, episode launches, you know, we peak with analytics and then it goes down and then we peak with every episode release and now that the students are out, the last episode we released after graduate, after commencement was a little lower than we had expected. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how to grow that. I do think though that there's a value in saying that we're doing this, that SOM is supporting this and so um, maybe not all of it is quantifiable at the moment. And I will also make a note that, so Libsyn, the publishing platform, has some pretty it's okay analytics. They'll show you how many downloads per episode when. Um, however, Apple is sort of a black box and they give you very, very little. Um, so it's been really hard to see what the drop off rates have been, um, uh, how many people have actually listened. We, we consciously made our episodes only 20 to 30 minutes to try to make, again, a hypothesis. We just thought that a 45 minute conversation for our listeners maybe wasn't the, the way to launch. Um, but I personally listen to hour and a half long podcasts. So um, so it's very, I, I feel, hope, I'm hoping that the innovations within the podcasting space in, in, include analytics and some of the more, um, some of the, um, the insights into that. Yes. You mentioned, uh, I think in your pre-productions, uh, having a tight script. How, how tight do you work, how close do you work with your guests? Um, can you just talk about that please? Sure. Um, so, we have an alum and a student. And so I work, I usually take the first stab at the script and then I share it with the student. And then I sit with that student and I, I walk them through, I actually have them talk through the intro and outro with me um, just so they feel comfortable with it. I have them go through almost every question. Um, I'd say half of my student, half of the students I've worked with have been very proactive and have asked a lot of their own questions. I'd say the other half didn't do that at all. <laughs> yeah. It's just the way it is. Um, so uh, the prep work, the in-person prep work was really helpful. However, a lot of them are not used to being in the studio. And so uh, it took, you know, we usually allow for about an hour and a half um, from start to finish, even though the podcast itself, the final product is only 20 minutes. There's an hour and a half there. And so by the end of the conversation, the student is warmed up. Um, and we usually go back and re-record re the intro outro. I see guy nodding. He's yeah. He, people. It takes a while for us to get comfortable on on on. Uh, yeah. Uh, is that answer your question? Yes. yes okay. Great. I'm just curious yeah. now. How did you identify your students? Was this you know somewhat of a reward for them, or you know how did you find them? Um. So that's a great question. Um. So I'll mention that. I don't even know if I remember exactly, but I, I remember um, I wanted to put together a matrix. So the first thing I did was we put together an idea of the uh, sectors that we wanted to cover. So we wanted to cover for SOM, we wanted to cover, at least in the launch season, we wanted to cover consulting, finance, sustainability, um, healthcare, technology, venture capital. We knew we wanted to kind of hit these topics. So um, the pre-production process took quite a bit 
for this exact reason, because we were coming up with this matrix of students and alum and trying to connect them. That was, that was probably the most difficult part of this whole process and the most time consuming for us. So after I, we came up with these themes, I reached out to our alumni office and I said, can you give me a list of alums that you think would be uh, willing to articulate their experiences within this? They gave me a list. Then I reached out to a couple other people, both my colleagues in the office, colleagues in the entrepreneurship um, program, um, a couple students that I knew, asking them, do you know any current students? Do you know any alums that are in this space? So I created this matrix, right? Students, alums, sectors. Um, I tried to see where the overlap was, and then I made the asks. In some cases, I went to the alums first and said, would you be interested in doing this, and then matched them with a student. In a lot of cases, I had a student in mind already because um, I had one or two students got me three or four students, so it was kind of a lovely kind of network effect um, of finding a couple great students. Um, uh, find those champions within the student body, right? So I had a student government president who was very, very helpful and proactive. I had one student who did the, vet, who did the most recent episode, Michelle Kwan, who um, is in, interested in venture capital. Um, I think she's gonna be more of a producer this, this coming year. She's really interested in being more active. Um, so it's sort of piecing it together when you can. In the back. Intellectual property and branding. Um, I hosted one a few years ago on the Up Broadcast and all everything, so we didn't really deal with that. So how does that work, guidelines, yeah, legal, if you just kind of went off and did your own and hosted it somewhere? <laughs> uh, plausible divine, deni I don't know. Um, <laughs> so. It, uh, that's a great question. I feel like um, I work with a colleague who's, who, who can speak maybe more specifically about that, who's been um, working with you know, Yale branding for a lot longer than I have. Um, uh, and so he can probably articulate that better than I could. Um, he's been able to help me. Again, I get this is not a, I, 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 if I had brought everybody here who had participated in this uh, effort, there would this, you know, probably be more, more than you sitting there. Um, so my colleague is sort of aware of what we should and shouldn't do with the Yale mark. The designer that we worked with is also sort of familiar with that, so we had sort of a, um, a, good, uh, a good insight. But I would say, when in doubt, I guess ask John Gamble, and um, I guess if you need to, ask general counsel. Um, that's probably the best way to go. Did we do that? Uh, no. <laughs> I didn't know if anyone was listening or certainly on the iTunes U. I've never heard any feedback, and it seems to be very gray yeah. in terms of general counsel. So iTunes U is probably going to go away. Um, so if you have a podcast and you want it to be listed within our iTunes U or within um, Yale's uh, brand, first of all, it's very difficult to get there these days. Yale has made it, or I'm sorry, Apple has made it very difficult, but that is actually probably going to be, go, be going away. But in the near term, if you do want your podcast or audio there and you have something in the Apple store, you can send it to Ryan McAvoy and he will make it happen. He will also add it to their SoundCloud playlist. Mm -hmm. So that's something else you should, you should be doing. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. um, Yes, I work in uh, communications for the Miami Library, and we actually, I started a visual podcast about a month ago, and we've had about uh, two going on three episodes now. Um, and the main reason we have a visual podcast is because we're working with actual manuscripts and material that people need to see in campus mm -hmm. here. Um, so have you had any experience uh, with visual podcasts, and so? sort of input. Um, I'm currently hosting it, which does allow for more consistent work to be put out, and it has to do with the actual faculty working to find a key on-site, and as well as off-site access service members, uh, preservation, and all that, so. Uh. I don't know anything about uh, visual podcasts. Um, in fact, I'm sort of, because we don't have this visual medium, I totally get why you need that, yeah. right? For us, uh, it's more ideas-based, and so there's not as much visual uh, accompaniment. So, in fact, I'm in, we're advising one faculty member who has video uh, recorded all of these interviews. We're just going to also be just releasing them audio only and stripping out the video. That works for us, doesn't work for you. So, you have a unique challenge, and I, yeah, podcasting that or making that audio only or, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't really work for you. Um, so I would probably say you have more in common with my video colleagues. Um, so connecting with John Zabrowski and Ben Hecht at SOM might be a great, you know, if, you, if you're looking for colleagues to, uh, to collaborate with or to just, you know, pick their brain, they would be a good place to start.
Yeah, Emily. Um, I was just, I, I've been reflecting on the idea of how this connects to our overall content strategy and our uh, communication strategy. I think I feel really passionately that podcasts are kind of a, a MOOC or kind of a, um, they're, they're a way for the vast majority of people in the world who could never have direct access to Yale to have it in their heads and to learn. One of our faculty who may be participating in, in one of the SMM podcasts later said, it's like having her office hours, but you know, for everybody. And um, so people can, you know, I think that we do a lot of that on our website um, and in our media relations and so forth, but this is just like pure, uncut, you know, I mean, it's physically cut, but you know, um, pure, um, you know, um, access. And I think we're all, everyone in the university, it's the university school and all of our individual schools <coughs> have more uh, openness and to, to reach more people. I like that. I think that's so perfect. And that resonates. You were just leading that session with, and Fiona said something. So one of our professors, Fiona Scott Morton, was just talking about how you know, in the classroom, she could only reach so many people. But when she's on Twitter, she can reach thousands. And being able to open up sort of what is seemed like a closed box, like the Yale classroom, <coughs> is, I think is really important. And I think, I hope that that's a hypothesis that we're, we're using and, and why, why it's so important to podcast and to share these stories between students and alum, because it's not normally something that, it's as if you're sitting in on an a informational interview, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's why we are doing these recordings. And so we're hoping that by doing that, we're demonstrating a lot of what maybe you can't see at Yale SOM in terms of content. Yeah. Um, do you have a budget for promoting that to, you know, buy, you know, ads on Google or, you know, boost on Facebook, anything like that? Um, some paid social, but like, one of the things on my agenda items for the next couple weeks is, um, is basically what else should we be doing. Um, so there's a lot that one can do to promote. I mentioned creating a news item, uh, putting out social posts, doing some, not just kind of native stuff, but in organic stuff rather, but like, you know, really doing some paid social. Um, transcripts help with SEO. Um, there's a number of articles recently that have talked about the reasoning behind having your own, having a podcast's own website and Google now has some tags that you can add to your website that will allow your podcast to be found within their um, Google, their algorithm. Um, and what else I going to mention about SEO as well? So SEO, I think, is really important. So no, we don't have a dedicated budget. It's something that I am thinking about right now uh, after this first season and, and looking back at what worked and what didn't work. Promotion is something that we need to focus on. Yeah, I um, just started to do it for the McMillan Report. And it blew me away at how many more impressions that we got. I mean, tens of thousands. I mean, it's shocking. For next to no money, for like $20. So that's great to know. totally worth it. <laughs> we've noticed, actually, we haven't done as, as quite as much as I'd like, but we've noticed, too, we, we try to include it in some of our email marketing. So prospective students, prospective student mm -hmm. emails, alumni email newsletters, um, I think that's driven a little bit of traffic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, from a hardware standpoint, are you working mostly with equipment that you already had in house, or did you have any sort of budget for acquisition? How was that? How did you go about that? So, uh, yes, yes, and yes. Um, cool. So, uh, <laughs> we're really lucky at SOM. We've got a dedicated team downstairs, and at the moment, they're willing to work with us. Um, and so I've relied really heavily on them. Um, I have, you know, we, we also have, I have two colleagues who are um, video, dedicated video colleagues who have the equipment and one of them had, had to pinch hit for me because I didn't have any studios available for me, which is another lot, reason why you should DIY because chances are when your subjects are only, are only available in that one hour interval, like, then you can't find a studio. So you should always have that backup space. You should always have your equipment, even if you think you're going to do it in a studio. So we do have a little bit of, they have equipment. My colleagues have equipment. Um, omnidirectional mics, which may or may not, they work out just fine, though, in this case. Um, and then backups are really important. So he, has, he had a dedicated backup recorder. If you're in a studio, they already have a backup set up. Um, so if you're going to buy your own equipment, microphone, you know, uh, backup. Uh, backup recording situation, um, but you could also do that a lot online. And so I just relied on Zencaster as a backup too. Um, uh, I know the Broadcasting Center has an ISDN line that I have a I have a telephone line that people can call in. Um, we've been using tape syncs, which is basically what that means is. And again, 
I recommend using a tape sync. It basically is somebody who will go to a spot that's not where you're at, or maybe where you're at, and just record that audio side of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, we did that all, we did that in, in each case. Um, and it's about $150 an hour. Um, that's not a lot of money if you want really great, clean audio. Um, yeah, so if you have the budget for it, I think um, doing a, a tape sync for any of your off-site stuff is, is, is important, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, if you can, if you're doing a podcast, if you're launching one, if you're thinking about launching one, if you could reach out to me, I'd love to kind of get a group together across scale mm -hmm. um, and just try to, co you know, collaborate a little bit more. I think it's something that I know I hear a lot of, a lot of people doing, and um, I'm learning a lot. I know I can learn a lot from you. Um, maybe you can turn me into a more of an expert. Uh, and uh, and yeah. So thank you for coming. Um, and uh, connect with me. So thanks. Yeah.